key ring mechanism is so sensitive that it can detect tiny changes in the pressure of the air around us, convert that to electrical signals in neurons and send it to our brain. Our brain makes sense of these sounds, not just in terms of sounds, but also in terms of language. I mean, you can even hear a whisper. Being so sensitive, there are mechanisms in the ear that can help protect this apparatus from very, very loud sounds. You can imagine if you've got something that's incredibly sensitive, if you hit it with a very high pressure wave, you could damage it. And we do damage our ears. Um, the acoustic reflex is a mechanism by which loud sounds are dampened as quickly as possible to protect those mechanisms of the ear. The anatomy is a little bit complicated. There are a couple of cranial nerves involved. There are a couple of tiny muscles. So what we'll do is we'll talk about the sensory input. I've talked about the anatomy of the ear elsewhere, but we'll talk about the sensory input, the brainstem reflex, the motor output, and then, you know, some clinical bits and bobs about this, all right? All right then, ear, ear. Um, this often gets called the, the stapedial uh, reflex, but actually there are two muscles involved, uh, kind of. We'll talk about that. Um, so sometimes it also gets called the middle ear reflex, um, which might be a more appropriate name. Uh, outer ear, inner ear is in there, middle ear in, is in there. As we're gonna follow the reflex pathway, we'll find out what those muscles are at the end. Uh, but in here, so this is the petrous part of the temporal bone, take off that chunk of bone. Now we can see the, the structures of the inner ear. Here is the cochlea. So here is the sensory apparatus. Um, there is the tympanic membrane, the eardrum that's detecting the pressure waves. And there are some tiny muscles, uh, tiny bones in there, the ossicles of the ear, malleus, incus and stapes, that translate those movements, those deflections of the tympanic membrane um, into movements of the, the oval window. Um, and the cochlea is filled with fluid and has some very sensitive hair cells in there. So those pressure waves are trans to the fluid inside the cochlea cause deflections of the hair cells. And that then is the sensory part of the reflex. And the nerve here is the vestibulocochlear nerve. Um, so the cochlear part of the vestibulocochlear nerve, sometimes called the auditory nerve, this is the afferent part of the reflex. Sensory information is traveling through here, cranial nerve eight, back to the brainstem. It doesn't have far to go. Um, Here, that's the opening, that's where the, the nerve runs to, and here, inside the cranial cavity. Here then, here's the brain. Um, we're only interested in the brainstem for this reflex. So there's the medulla, the pons, and the midbrain up there. And cranial nerve eight, the vestibulocochlear nerve, is entering the brainstem where the pons becomes the medulla, pretty much. And all of that sensory information is going to run into the brainstem and into the, the cochlear nucleus. That cochlear nucleus is right there at the pontomedullary angle, so the neurons are not going far. This happens on both sides. There's one for the left, one for the right. And interneurons are going to take some of that information and send it to the facial motor nucleus and the trigeminal motor nucleus. In fact, we can see right next to the vestibulocochlear nerve is the facial nerve, cranial nerve seven, and just up there is the trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve five. It's not entirely clear what these interneurons are. They haven't entirely been worked out yet. Maybe the superior olivary nucleus is involved. This lump here is the olive. <laughs> there are lots of neurons in here and lots of connections that we haven't fully worked out yet. And I say the, the motor nucleus of the facial nerve, but we can also identify the um, stapedius motor neurons. So a group of motor neurons that are gonna innovate the stapedius muscle. I'm giving the game away a little bit. Um, they receive some of those connections from the cochlear nucleus. And um, there are also um, tensor tipani motor nuclei next to 
the motor nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. Um, again, giving the game away, um, which are going to send fibres out to those two muscles respectively. We'll follow those out in a moment, but it's worth pointing out that we, so we have a collection of nerve cell bodies next to the, the motor nucleus of the facial nerve, and those nerve cell bodies are going to send their axons out to the stapedius muscle, and they're going to innervate that muscle. But this isn't the only way that those neurons could be stimulated. That, though that group of uh, neurons has a whole bunch of inputs from a whole bunch of different parts of uh, the central nervous system, and it's not entirely clear what they all do. And it's the same for the tensor tympani neurons as well. The tensor tympani motor neurons also have mo multiple inputs, not just from this reflex. But that's the reflex bit then in the brainstem at the pontomedullary angle. Um, sensory input comes into the cochlear nucleus. There are some interneurons that connect to the motor nucleus of the facial nerve and connect to the motor nucleus of the trigeminal nerve and they connect to both sides. So a sensory input from one side will trigger those motor neurons on both sides. So let's follow the motor bit out and then we're doing the, the efferent part of the, the reflex, right? Do those one at a time, I guess. Well, the facial nerve is the easy one, I think. So right next to cranial nerve eight is cranial nerve seven, as I said. So the facial nerve is right next to the vestibulocochlear nerve. And in fact, that there is the vestibulocochlear nerve, this nerve running with it. So they both run into the internal acoustic meatus here. This nerve running with it is the facial nerve. And the facial nerve is gonna run through these spaces of the ear and give off branches that will do all sorts of things. The facial nerve is very busy, but one of the branches that will give off will be the nerve to stapedius, very sensibly named, which is gonna to go to the stapedius muscle. Now the stapedius muscle, here's an ear on the other side. Um, the stapedius muscle, well, that there is, is stapes, uh, the smallest bone in the body. I think you can probably get a, size, a sense of its scale from the size of this ear versus my ear. So the stapes bone is the smallest bone in the body. It's the last bone in that chain of small bones transducing the vibrations of the tympanic membrane to the cochlea. And the stapedius muscle, <laughs> the smallest muscle in the body, is so small, I don't think I've got a model that shows it, but the facial nerve then, is going to innervate the stapedius muscle and the stapedius muscle is going to have a little bit of tone and it's going to it's going to um, you know dampen the movements of the stapes bone a little bit so it's going to dampen those vibrations uh, in terms of the acoustic reflex if a loud sound enters the ear causes the tympanic membrane to vibrate those vibrations are carried across the ossicles through stapes to the cochlea the hair cells in the cochlea detect that loud sound, send that sensory information back through the um, vestibulocochlear nerve to the brainstem, to the cochlear nucleus, and that then triggers those interneurons, that reflex, to trigger the motor nucleus of the facial nerve, specifically the motor neurons to the stapedius muscle. And those neurons will then run out with the facial nerve back in this direction, and the nerve to stapedius, a branch of the facial nerve, will run to the stapedius muscle and that will trigger stapedius to contract fully. That then will severely limit the movements of the stapes bone, the last bone in the chain of those vibrating ossicles. So that will then limit the amount of energy, the amount of force transmitted to the cochlea, protecting the hair cells. All right? Back to the brain stem, what about the other nerve then? So that was one set of motor neurons that were triggered by the reflex. The other set of motor neurons triggered by the reflex were part of the trigeminal nerve. Um, motor nuclei, so motor neurons for tensor tympani. So up here, there's the trigeminal nerve. So those motor neurons will run out with the trigeminal nerve. Um, and that's what we see in there. So that's the trigeminal nerve there. And down here we can see 
the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve, the third branch of the trigeminal nerve, the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve, is going to drop down deep to the mandible. One of its main jobs to, is to innovate the muscles of mastication. And this is the nerve that's also going to run to tensor tympani. We can add some more detail. There's the trigeminal nerve there. This is the mandibular branch running down here. Just after it passes through the bone, we find the otic ganglion. Now the neurons that are going to run to tensor tympani will run through the otic ganglion. They're not going to synapse, they're just running through it. And then, well, we've actually had the ear taken out here, but the ear is right here. So the nerve to tensor tympani is a branch from the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve, and that will run to the tensor tympani muscle. Which muscle's that? Here it is. Here's the tensor tympani muscle. So this is the eustachian tube, or the pharyngotympanic tube, that's going to open up inside the, the nasopharynx. So the tensor tympani muscle runs from uh, the walls of the uh, eustachian tube, and it's going to run to the handle of the malleus bone, which is actually connected to the tympanic membrane. Um, so again, the purpose of this muscle is to dampen the vibration. So normally there's maybe a little bit of tone here helping to dampen the vibrations of the tympanic membrane and the other ossicles. Um, and in terms of the acoustic reflex, it is considered to take part in the acoustic reflex. So again, a loud sound travels into the ears. That, the, that, that high loud sound is detected. Sensory information is sent to the brainstem through the vestibulocochlear nerve into neurons, then fire um, neurons in the motor nucleus of the trigeminal nerve, specifically to the tensor tympani muscle, um, which then causes that muscle to contract and dampen the vibrations of the tympanic membrane. But it's, it's, the stapedius muscle is more important and more effective in that reflex than tensor tympani. And tensor tympani is largely considered to be important in dampening the sounds of the temporomandibular joint, as in it dampens the sounds of chewing and eating, so sounds that we make, internal sounds a little bit. But those are the two muscles that are involved in this. You can see how tensor tympani gets its name, right? Tense is the tympanic membrane. So this is why the anatomy is tricky. Um, we've got two muscles here innervated by two different cranial nerves kind of doing similar but slightly different jobs. Um, I remember tensor tympani trigeminal nerve. So the tensor tympani muscle is innervated by the trigeminal nerve, which means that stapedius must be innervated by um, the facial nerve. This reflex is not instantaneous. It re relies on sound being detected by the cochlea to trigger this reduction in sound, reduction in volume, this protective mechanism. Um, it may that whole reflex may take between 10 milliseconds and 150 milliseconds, maybe 40 milliseconds. It varies, but I mean, that's kind of 40, 50 milliseconds is a number that I've seen. So um, this, this can be measured, which means that these numbers are known. Anyway, there are a few important points to make here. Um, the reflex takes some time, which means the hair cells in the cochlea can be damaged before for the reflex takes effect, right? Also, these are tiny, tiny muscles, which means they will contract and dampen these loud sounds, but they'll only manage to do that for a very short period of time, and then they'll need to um, relax and recover their energy, right? These are skeletal muscles. These are the smallest skeletal muscles in the body. Um, also, these muscles have a normal function. Like right now, your stapedius muscle is dampening your ossicles as you're listening to me talk. And the stapedius muscle is innervated by a branch of the facial nerve. Now, um, the facial nerve, um, it's going to run through the inner ear and it's going to come out here in the uh, stylomastoid foramen and it's going to innervate all the muscles of facial expression. There's a condition called Bell's palsy where we see paralysis of the muscles of facial expression. Because the facial nerve has been injured, it's most likely to have occurred because of a, a virus or an infection causing inflammation 
as the facial nerve enters the bone here and there's nowhere for that swelling to go so the facial nerve gets compressed and we see Bell's palsy, we see paralysis of the facial muscles just on that side. Now if that infection, if that inflammation passes far enough up to affect the nerves to, to, to stapedius, then the nerve to stapedius will also be paralyzed. Uh, and as its normal job is to dampen the movements of the stapes bone, of the ossicles, that function will be lost, which means that some sounds will sound a lot louder than normal. This is um, a form of hyperacusis. There are many causes of hyperacusis. Um, thing, sounds sounding louder than they normally would or normally should, but if somebody has Bell's palsy, that's something to look out for. And that demonstrates how the stapedius muscle is more important in dampening loud sounds and controlling that volume because with Bell's palsy, it's only the facial nerve that has been injured, so the tensor tympani muscle should still be functioning and yet um, loud sounds occur on that side. So stapedius the stapedius muscle seems to be more important in the, uh, the acoustic reflex. Now, um, oh, the other thing is, is that um, when you're in a very loud, noisy environment and you're, you're in a, a noisy room, but you can still hear the conversation, you can still have a conversation with the person in front of you that you're close to, you can still hear what they're saying. That also seems to be a part of this. So um, the noise in a party, in a loud room, tends to be kind of, it's kind of uh, low frequency sounds that get to your ear. So the acoustic reflex and these muscles seem to be important in dampening down, it's like a, it's a, a, like a, a low frequency filter. They dampen down that loud background noise in the room. So the mid and the higher frequencies can still be picked up and you can still have a conversation with the person in front of you. So this is a, also a normal function about, you know, being able to, um, hear somebody in a loud room. Now you can test this reflex clinically. So an audiologist can use a probe and put it in the ear and the probe is gonna generate sounds at a controlled level. And it's also gonna generate, well, pressure waves, sounds, vibrations, which will cause the tympanic membrane to vibrate. And there, there's a microphone, there are pressure sensors in there, which will then detect how the pressure changes as a result of the tympanic membrane changing compliance, stiffening. So if you trigger the acoustic reflex and the stapedius muscle contracts and dampens the movements of the chain of the ossicles and then also dampens the movements of the tympanic membrane, you can detect that with the probe, which means that you can detect over time. So you can trigger the acoustic reflex by raising up that sound signal. And then you can measure over time, milliseconds and seconds, how the, how the compliance of the tympanic membrane changes. So essentially you can, you can see the acoustic reflex occurring. And then because the acoustic reflex is bilateral, so you can trigger a sound in one side and that should trigger the stapedius muscle on both sides to contract. This means that using that tool you can determine where the pathology is if somebody is losing their hearing. And then also you can record this over time, days, weeks, months, years, to see how that pathology is maybe changing, improving or getting worse. Um, so you can make use of the acoustic reflex to help you understand what might be going wrong with the mechanisms of the ear. And that's the other reason why this reflex is important. Interesting, huh? Okay, so that's the neuroanatomy of the acoustic reflex, kind of to where we understand it as now. Like I say, we still don't understand all of the links in the brainstem to those motor neurons going to the stapedius and tensor tympani muscles. There are lots of other inputs into those neurons that we don't know what they do, but it does seem to be that some people can cause their tensor tympani muscle to contract without a loud sound or chewing sounds. Anyway, right, as usual, getting off topic. See you next week.